for the Word of God. We're grateful for the Holy Spirit, that he's our teacher, that he's our counselor, that he's our helper, that he's our reminder. And Lord, I ask that our hearts would receive the word today, that our, that our soil would be a, a place of bountiful reception for the word of God, that it would bring forth fruit in this day and age. Holy Spirit, we don't want to hear from a man today. There's enough men out there preaching, but we want to hear from the word of God, from the throne of God. We want to hear a rhema living word for this moment in time. And Lord, we are sanctified by the blood of Christ that we are receivers of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you have your Bibles with you today, see that? If you have your Bibles with you, oh, New King James. Thompson chain reference. We're going into the final chapter of our series on sound eschatology, unless we want to talk about the seven churches in Revelation, which we can do at another time and continue it on. We've studied all the apostles and we've gave a, a, a very good, strong, powerful look into what they had to say. Some of their biggest points that they're famous for uh, as far as eschatology. And of course, last but not least, is uh, the Apostle Brian Whitaker. I mean, no, uh, the Apostle uh, Peter today we're going to take a look at. And uh, let's just see where the Lord leads us. I like just uh, today, just opening up the word, and we're just going to see where it goes. Amen? Wow, you're, pr you're pathetic. I mean, prophetic today. Wow. <laughs> I want to open up with just a little background. We're actually going to look mainly at 2 Peter 3 today. But I want to set the stage because Peter, uh, in his, his two letters, he's really... <coughs> He's really speaking to trials and tribulations and persecutions that we face as believers. He's, he's speaking to struggles that we all have. And he's, he's trying to encourage the church. And he's trying to give them like the real talk and, and, and show them uh, things that are going on. And as you read 1 Peter, you go into 2 Peter. And it's interesting that Peter's very chronological in his teachings. And so at 2 Peter 2 and 3, he transitions to the last part of his, his written teaching that we have. Have, and he talks about eschatology for the last two chapters of 2 Peter. And so 2 Peter 2 is kind of this transition, and it mirrors Tim, uh, uh, Timothy, what Paul wrote to Timothy. It mirrors what Jesus said. It mirrors what Jude said. And you'll find it very interesting. It mirrors what John said. So, I mean, we are really getting a strong warning from every single apostle with the same exact message. So let's just take a look really quickly in 2 Peter 2. This is what Peter says, But false prophets also arose amongst the people, just as there also will be false teachers amongst you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. That's a strong word we're going to take a look at. Okay, so there's, there's this rise that there's going to be false prophets and false teachers infiltrating and attacking the church. This was written 2,000 years ago, and he's saying more is coming. More is coming. It's going to be on the rise. It's going to be on the increase. Once again, what I want you to take away, one of the things I want you to take away from this is how strong these warnings are. It's, it, it, if it's talked about in the Bible this much, to this extent, by every apostle, we need it to be ingrained into us. Amen? Even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many who follow in their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed... They will exploit you with false words. And their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Very interesting. If you look in the modern church, especially in the, in the, uh, the American church of this day and age, one of the things that you'll notice is there's a lot of exploitation going on out of the pulpits. 
In fact, uh, I encourage you, I had posted it up on my page, that, uh, and maybe we should watch it sometime. There's a series that they started called The American Gospel. And it's, a, it's an exposition on the state of, a ch in, of the church in the United States today. Very, very powerful stuff. I mean, it mirrors exactly what we're doing here. And uh, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll have a, a Thursday or something where we'll, we'll get together and watch it. But I encourage you, it, it's powerful. And so it's talking about a lot of these things. When you have ministers walking around demanding that they have $65, $75 million jets... I would say we are being exploited by greed. When you have the, one, the largest ministry in the United States saying that they can't travel on commercial airlines to minister because the demons of the people around them take away from their ability to minister. Houston, we got a problem. That's a lame excuse to, have your, to, to uh, give yourself a nice little plane ride. And they actually brag about it. And, you know, there's such an, uh, an exploiting message in the church. I mean, it is proliferated throughout the church. And, you know, even, in, even in, in Sebastian, you know, there was, Pastor Tom was really distressed because he, he got asked to speak and minister at this uh, celebration of, this, of a church in Sebastian. It was like their 30th anniversary or some, something like that. And it was all about raising money to pay off the church debt. It turned out to be a giant fundraiser. It had nothing to do with, you know, celebrating the church there. It was like, well, if you really want to be blessed and be a part of this, everyone needs to sign a pledge form today. So the pastor can retire and he owns And the pastor happens to own the property. So guess who gets to be the recipient of the paying off of the mortgage? Hmm, the pastor. That, my friends, is what the, these scriptures are talking about. We are in that day where you are being e exploited. The flock is being exploited by these sensual-based, greed-filled teachers claiming to be ministers of God. And, you know... Uh, I would make, not necessarily it's my place to judge that person, but I can judge those actions and something's not right with that. I would say it falls under exploiting the flock. There's many scriptures about that. Many scriptures. And so let's take a, let's take a quick look at the word destructive heresies. Opalia, it comes from cut off or destruction, causing someone or something to be completely severed or cut off entirely from what could or should have been. Okay? It does not simply apply annihilation, but the loss of well-being rather than being. And there's many other supportive scriptures there uh, for those of you watching the video. And so the destructive... The destructive force behind these heresies literally cuts you off from your divine destiny and calling. It cuts you off. It severs you. So destructive heresies, another, another uh, way to look at it, other Bibles use the term damnable heresies. Damnable heresies. So there are things being in taught in the church that Peter was addressing that were damnable heresies. So do you think it is not out of the equation that if while the apostles walked the earth, damnable heresies were being introduced to the church? Is it not out of the realm of possibilities that this would happen today? And what's sad is we don't have apostolic oversight in this day and age. It's kind of a free-for-all out there. There's nobody correcting this stuff. There's not a lot of people challenging this stuff. And the, the body itself is blind to what's going on, and the flocks are being exploited. And so a true, sound minister of God, you know, this is, this is one of the reasons why Paul said, I'm not going to take a cent from you. Paul said as an example, I'm not going to take a cent from you, even though I, I legally can, based on New Testament uh, pattern and design for giving. He says, I have the right to receive 
from the flock for my ministry. But I'm not going to do that as an example. So he had a tent making business where when he wasn't on the mission field, he had a private business where he made and sold tents in the market. And he supported himself. Now, he's saying, like, listen, you have the right. Ministers should be taken care of, you know, financially. There's a whole bunch of scriptures on that. and But not to live some high on the hog, you know, jet airplane, BMWs, million-dollar mansions. That's not biblical. There's nothing wrong with having wealth, but a, a rich minister better have some, uh, some sort of investment or business on the side that's causing it, not from the church. I'll just say it how I see it, and let you, you be the judge of what I said. Let's go further. Deceptive spiritual leaders. Notice there's two types. There's false prophets and there's false teachers. Everything all right? Everything all right? Is he okay? Okay. Billy wasn't feeling good today. False prophets and false teachers. And so, false prophets claim to speak a message on God's behalf or possess a new spiritual knowledge, so to speak. Okay, I'll give you an example. The prophet Muhammad claimed to have a new message from God and a new gospel. Joseph Smith, who started Mormonism, claimed to have a new message from God and a new gospel and new information that God has been holding back. That's how you can tell the difference. The false prophets try to start movements. So uh, they, they claim that they are speaking, because that's what prophets do. The gift of prophecy is to speak a living word on God's behalf. So the true prophetic word may say something directly to the church like, you know, we have to be very careful because there's uh, things coming into town of Sebastian over the next year that are going to pull people away. That would be a prophetic word. Or a prophetic word may say like, just pick someone at random, like say, Robin, you have an issue. The Lord showed me you have an issue at work where someone said this about you and God wants you to know this. And that really happened, you'll know. That's a prophetic word. And so false prophets, they also, pro true prophets, open up the word of God and make it applicable for the right now. They open up something in the Word of God and make it applicable right now to guide the church through a season. Amen? False prophets pull you away from all that by using the same technique, and they'll often use scripture. That's the thing. False teachers, they kind of alter by addition or subtraction the Word of God. So they'll add their own viewpoint to it, or they'll take away something that's in the Word of God and ignore it or try to preach it away. They generally deviate from the proper application of truth and of sound doctrine. So like a false teacher will say, if you don't give 10% of your money, God's not going to bless you. That is a false application of Scripture, and that is a false word. That's a false teaching. They have deviated from sound doctrine. They took, a, they took the Word of God and they added or subtracted to add their narrative in and get you to go along with it. So those are the differences between the two, and both of them fall under this category. Heretical, they're greedy, they exploit people, they're, sent, they're based in sensuality and manipulation. Those are their fruits. That's how you know them. You want to know what, what a preacher is all about? I'll tell you one way that you can know what he's about that's fail-safe. Look how he handles money. Look how a preacher views or handles money. If they say the man of God is supposed to be blessed and supposed to be wealthy, put your red alerts up. Put your red alerts up. You know, what people don't realize, and being I know certain people in the banking industry, you would not be, you would be shocked at what the bankers see as far as ministers' finances. 
because they see what you're doing with your money every time they pull up your account. Not because they're nosy, because it shows up. And there'll be a red flag. <laughs> Insufficient funds. Six times in one year. I mean, that's a red flag. You should be a, 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 a true minister, not that you never have financial problems, but you should be stable financially. You should pay your bills on time. Right? You should be good with money. You should be a good example of money. And so I try to live as a very good example to the church, and we try to stay within our budget and do the best we can with our money. We don't go in the red. We don't overspend. We try our best, best to stay out of debt, except for stupid medical insurance that don't cover anything anymore. But other than that, you know, we, we, we live righteously with our money. Amen? Yep, 2 Peter 3 says this. It's a big reminder and warning. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am, say it with me, stirring up your sincere mind. Big statement there. Don't ignore that. A sincere mind. What do you think a sincere mind is? Anyone want to take a shot at it? What's a sincere mind? One that focuses on Yeah, one, one, that, uh, one that really has a heart and a disposition towards truth. We should all have a sincere mind towards the things of God in this room. That means you're genuine. You know, it's, it's, a big, it's the big part of your life. It's, a, it's an internal disposition. But I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. How many know we have to be reminded of things? I do, right? Why? So that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. You hear that? Remember, they're stirring it up. They're stirring it up. They're stirring up your remembrance. They're stirring up your mind to keep you focused and sincere in the truth. But know this first. Know this first. Here's the first thing. That in the last days, mockers will come following after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of the, his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. So, in other words, these people are saying, look, all this talk all the time of Jesus is going to return, Jesus is going to return. Well, he ain't returned. And now we're 2,000 years later, and I, you know, obviously he's not coming back, or he'd be here by now. That's what they say. Anyone ever heard that before? I have. Scoffers and mockers. Here's the answer, though. For when they maintain this, what do they maintain? That position that Christ is not going to return? It escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Okay, so here we go. We look at the past. So they have to realize that, first of all, by the power of God, by the word of God, the universe came into existence. There's no other way that the world could have, it couldn't have just, you know, science, the evolution would say there was nothingness, and all of a sudden there was something. We don't know how, but nothingness made something, and there was so much of something, and all this information just randomly showed up, and there was a big explosion, and out of an explosion, we have the complexities of life and the universe and all these things. I've never seen an explosion make anything, first of all, except a mess, but I digress there. So they're saying, look... God made the world, that's proof number one. Don't forget, that was a long time ago, right? And through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. He makes a reference to the flood. And now verse 7. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. Oh, there's no such thing as God's judgment. 
So the first judgment, this makes it very clear, was the worldwide flood. The second judgment is that of fire. I do not believe this is symbolic based on one reason. If the first judgment was literally water, uh, based on that, based, based on logic, right? I don't keep, this will, this will work for me. That's something I can use. It would, it would not suddenly change where people say, well, they don't, he doesn't mean literally fire. It's going to be a cleansing, and everyone's going to be better after this. No, it says the word destruction. So to me, I'm just going to go to my third grade reading level and say, there's going to be a destruction coming based on fire. Amen? Amen. But do not let this one fact escape your notice. What's he using right here? So don't let this fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord... Now, this is a this is a very, very interesting passage. What we have here is a time paradox. We have a time paradox right now. Okay, we're going to talk about two different time zones right here. This happens a lot in Scripture, and it's one of the keys to understanding and dividing Scripture is you have to understand eternal from the natural. There are two different ways, two different dimensions to how it works. So Peter is addressing this. So with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Interesting time paradox. A, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Well, how, how could the, both be true at once? Well, in the eternal realm, God sits outside of the time domain. So let's say uh, everything, let's say this represents the entire universe, natural universe, right, that we, that we live in. And, and here it is sitting in the middle of God's, let's say this is eternity, this, this building here. So it's sitting in the middle of eternity. God, omniscience is all around it right this. Like, and he can look into the time zone. He can see you and actually be with you right now as an infant. He could literally transport himself back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and witness the whole thing. At the same time, he can see everything in the future, or every single future event, he knows exactly what's going to happen. So to him, he could look at it and literally go in one part of, part of time and one day could be stretched out in eternity as a thousand years. And God can spend a thousand years there if he wants. Or he could zip across the timeline a thousand years later instantly like that. That's the idea of what Peter's trying to give us. It's not like exactly like that, but he's giving you an idea of the time paradox that exists. So there's this time paradox because fr from what they understand in physics, our, our time-space dimension, we're actually traveling in a tube going like this forward. And it's, it's, a, it's a tube, it's a contained, because we know that this is, an this is not an infinite existence. So there's some boundary, and they believe it's like a tube, and you're going forward every nanosecond in time, and everything goes with you. So, like, when I go, in 10 seconds, I'm going to count to 10, and this, this stanchion is still going to be here. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I just counted 10 seconds to, uh, in the future what I just said, and it's still here. Why? Because it all goes with us. It's all bound. It's gravitationally bound. But we're moving through time. Which is really fascinating stuff. Physics, you know, there, there's so much to it that's blown the minds of the scientists that we can't understand about the nature of our reality. In fact, they, some of the top physicists that said, have come to the conclusion that, and, and uh, Neil and I were talking about this the other day, that this reality is actually, it's, it's a holographic image. 
In other words, like, you think that we see this chair as a solid, right? I could take this chair, pick it up, can't put my hand through it because it's a solid. But if I made myself small on the subatomic level, I can pass right through this chair. Why? Because the chair is a field of atoms and there's space between atoms. And so, in essence, there is no real chair. The chair is but a field of atoms that could dissipate you know, if, if you start it on fire, what happens to the chair? It's going to be, it's going to dissipate. The molecular structure is going to change because of fire. And the same thing is going to happen to the universe. The fire is going to come. The judgment of God is going to come. And it's going to, to destroy everything that is stained with sin. Because we can't inherit eternal life and be in this world. The universe, the universe is messed up. He said when, when the Lord does all this, he's going to roll it back like a scroll and the new heavens and the new earth are already being made right now interdimensionally. So it's going to roll back like a scroll. The fire is going to burn it all off and the universe, this universe is going to be upgraded and replaced by another universe where the spiritual and the physical combine perfectly. And our first fruit in it is the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is a resurrected body He's a new type of creation. He's a hybridized human being that has perfect DNA and perfectly spiritualized DNA where spirit and flesh combine into some sort of hybrid. And that's the new type of body we're going to have. That's the type of existence. When Jesus resurrected, he walked through walls. He could make himself appear and disappear at random, yet he still ate the fish with the, 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 the apostles. He could walk on water. Right? He, he did some crazy stuff, like make himself suddenly appear on the road to Emmaus and then just disappear. And it's really cool, but if you're a higher dimensional being, right, if you're from a higher dimension and his flesh is from a higher dimension, the new body he has, it's nothing for God to disappear or appear at random. Very simple for him. Amen? And so, you know, the eternity, the, the time above the line works much different than down here. We're stuck in four dimensional, four dimensions. We have four dimensions. And that's it. That's the world we live in. There is, they have discovered at least 12 dimensions that they're sure of uh, by way of mathematical equation. They said there, there has to be at least 12 higher dimensions. So even if there's just 12, and I suspect there's more than that, wouldn't you say that God has a higher perspective beyond our understanding? Amen? We're stuck at that constant rate, one nanosecond at a time. The definition of the future is one nanosecond from now. And you keep moving forward. We're all heading forward together down this time domain. Amen? So in the word and verse summary, verse 10, he says, but the day of the Lord, he's going to explain this further now, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Now that means, you know, you don't expect a thief to pop into your house and you're in bed sleeping, not suspecting it, right? And so, like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burnt up. So here's how it moves forward in the eschatological time. It's going to happen very suddenly. Very suddenly, right? When we least expect it. It's going to be an undeniable event. So these people that say, well, Jesus returned already spiritually, you just got to understand it by way of revelation. No, 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 no. It is going to be undeniable. When stuff starts smoking up, you're going to know it's time. Amen? Lord, it's time. Too bad JD's not here, right? It's going to be a judgment by fire. Specifically, he names the type of how it's going to be accomplished. And it's going to lead into total destruction eventually of this entire system is going to be destroyed. Amen? Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, 
what sort of people you ought to be in holy conduct and godliness. And I use three examples from this church of people who excel in holiness of conduct and godliness. Okay, these three folks here, if you want to really be something in the kingdom of God, those three folks set the standard. So that's just a prophetic word. You can pray about that yourselves. Amen? So looking for and hastening the coming of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. How many times is he saying this now? It's like the fourth time. But according to this promise, now here's for us, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's no evil in the presence of God. Okay? You know, and it's not, it's not even being judgmental towards the world, but this world is a very cruel and wicked place. You know, uh, I become sometimes very sensitive to the cruelty that goes on in the world. And, you know, there's so much cruelty out there. Cruelty to me is, is really the high point of evil. When you get pleasure from hurting another human being. When, you know, whether it be emotionally, physically, whatever, you know, bullying, that's an example of cruelty. That's beating a weaker person down just for the sure enjoy, enjoyment of inflicting fear and pain in that person and being dominant over them. It is the opposite completely of agape. So if you want to define what's the opposite of agape, well, I would challenge you cruelty is probably the opposite of agape. Complete destruction of the person for the sole sake of your pleasure of hurting them. You know how proliferate, proliferate little tongues, how, how proliferated that is in the world right now. We all do it sometimes. We've done it before. Right? That's why you cannot take revenge. Why do you think God says, let him take revenge for you and not you? Because the act of revenge is a pleasurable thing. Hurting someone else or destroying them. Now, God's going to, God calls that justice and He's going to divvy it out. But, you know, that's one of the tough things is He says, do not take revenge for anything. Don't put justice in your own hands, right? Ultimately, God's going to divvy out justice. You would hope, you know, the justice system in the earth is supposed to be an extension of God's justice, Romans 13th chapter. You know, but ultimately, these people who maybe got away with it, like O.J. Simpson, you don't get away with it in heaven because the video he has on you is the video of the actual events and you, you can't doctor it up or trick them with the glove that don't fit, right? There's not going to be an acquit there, trust me. If you don't come to repentance, you're going to be called, you're going to be called to task for murdering that couple. I'm just using that as an example. You don't get away with anything with God. He sees you when you're sleeping and knows when you're awake. Now, you know, we are not to be fearful of God. He's not this omnipotent taskmaster looking to tear you down. But at the same time, he knows everything about you and what you're doing. So, you know, we need to be reverent about that and respect it. Amen? Any questions? You need any word from these, any of these folks? I can bring them up real quick. If not, we'll move on to the next slide. I broke it down further. Our admonition and hope. So here's how the verse says. Because of these things, right? Because of what things? Having a proper eschatological perspective. Listen to this very carefully. Having a proper eschatological perspective. Because of that, we have to live godly. Now that's our exhortation and our encouragement. Because you have a good understanding of eschatological events, that is an encouragement to grow in the Lord. Amen? Because in the future, there's going to be the judgment of the ungodly and those that reject the gospel. And there's going to be rewards for us who persevere through our lives and live a life, uh, a faithful life of excellence. Amen? So that takes, that takes a, a real good breakdown of that verse and we'll move forward uh, in, in this section. Handling truth. Therefore, beloved, now all that said brings you to a therefore. 
See how you, you see the you see the progression? I like that. I'm going to use this. Whoever left that there, God bless you. You started something. I might tape it right to my computer here. I don't know. Let's see. I will. Maybe I'll maybe I'll get it tattooed on my arm. Right. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, here you go. Here's the imperative. You ready, Joanne? Be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. That's talking about your personal conduct and your attitudes. Be diligent. You're not with, at peace with God when you're doing things wrong. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> So be diligent to be found in peace. How are you at peace with God? Live godly. You know, live lovingly. And regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. Now here's salvation spoken of as an uncompleted process. This is process salvation. This is not talking about the day you got saved and born again. This is a process of saving. Amen? Just as our beloved brother Paul, listen to, I find this part is very fascinating right here. I pointed this out to a couple of other ministers one time. We were in a discussion about this a few years back, and they were like, man, i never seen that before like that. Watch this. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, and as also in all of his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So people that say this nonsense where there was two different gospels, one by Paul and the rest of the other apostles towards the Jews, and... Eh, this kind of destroys that whole paradigm because P Peter was sharing Paul's letters with the Jewish church here. And the same truth that Paul taught applied to the Jewish believers. Because don't forget, Paul taught that there is no Jew or Gentile anymore. Now, I put an asterisk here for the rest of the scriptures, and let's take a look why. Notice Peter recognized Paul's authority in his letters as to be on par with the rest of scripture. You see, Peter already recognized this written letters of Paul is doctrinal, Holy Ghost, pneuma-inspired, Word of God that is to be taken on par with the Scriptures. So Peter's saying, look at this is New Testament Scripture right here. This is the new stuff now. Pay attention to it. And the problem is... There, there are certain things that Paul writes that are hard to understand. That if you don't have the spirit, which the untaught and the unstable distorted, they were warping the things that Paul was saying. Watch. So, the diligent or the faithful believers, they live spotless and blameless. We are at peace with God. We rightly handle scriptures. We rightly handle apostolic teaching, and we will be rewarded at Christ's return. I'm just telling you what's in the verse right there. The unstable are not faithful. They do not live godly lives of excellence. They do not rightly divide or understand scripture. They do not agree with apostolic teaching, and they will suffer destruction. That's what the scripture's saying there. Just broke it down point by point. So let's put it all together. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard. Everyone say, be on your guard. Be on your guard. Here we go again. How many times are we saying to be on guard now in the past seven weeks? How many times did, did that scripture come up here? Constantly. 
Be on your guard. This is, this is a, 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 an imperative on our behalf. We have to take, it's a disposition, it's a watchfulness, it's a guarded, it's a vigilance, it's a watching, it's, it's paying attention, all those things. Can't live loosey-goosey, right, Sal? Got to pay attention. You got to constantly be evaluating. You got to constantly be discerning all the stimulus that comes your way. There's so much noise in the church right now. There's so many books. There's so much teaching. There's so many ministers. There's so many videos. There's all these different things being said. It's overwhelming sometimes. To me, sometimes I got to take a step back and say, I got to guard myself and make sure that, you know, such and such is really preaching the truth here. You know, it was, it was funny. I, I got into it with someone who, who posted from a very famous minister who preaches a lot of grace, talking about that if you don't give 10% to the church, all your money is cursed. And I'm like, where do you get that from? Because it's not in the New Testament anywhere. And well, blah, blah, blah. But they couldn't answer the question. I go, no. I, and you get attacked by vultures with these people because they're in love with these ministers. They idolize them. I said, not a single person has been able to give me a quote from Peter, Paul, John, James, or Jude that says that. I mean, there's, there's a blessing on generosity. That's scriptural. And I'm like, well, we're the, I said, I can back my position by scriptures. I can go into 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and get a very good uh, teaching from Paul, two chapters worth, on how to handle money as a New Testament believer. And ironically, nowhere is it mentioned that you have to give 10%. You're to give generously as God leads, he says in 2 Corinthians 9. And so giving, we should be generous people. But the church is not a storehouse for the tithe. There's no scripture that says that. A minister, giving money to a minister does not accrue a blessing on you. Nor does it accrue a curse if you don't. But you are to give generously, basically support the church and support other believers. That's our two functions of giving. You support the church, you support people in need. That's the gist of New, new Covenant teaching on giving. Not that some storehouse is there and if bring the first fruits. And that's all Old Covenant. We're not under the Old Covenant. And these people just don't want to receive truth. They don't love the Word of God. Everyone walks around, I love the Bible, yeah, the Word. But then when it comes down to it, you see what they're teaching, I says, yeah, you don't love the Bible. Because you wouldn't teach contrary to the New Testament. We're not under the Old Testament. As a covenant, we learn from the Old Testament. It's a type and shadow. The, the, the saints that went before us have a lot to teach us in the Old Covenant. There is designs and patterns of society and civilization that is given to us in the Old Testament. There's tons of value to it. But as far as the Mosaic Covenant, you and I are not under that covenant. We are under the covenant of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so, be on your guard, because people want to pull you away from that. They want to carry you away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. You can fall. You can backslide. People like to use that term for this. But, but falling away... You could be a steadfast believer for 40 years and you can blow it at the end by, by accepting one bad teaching and you could fall. It doesn't necessarily mean you go to hell, but you can fall from a steadfast place. I didn't say that. Peter did. Judge it for yourself. That's the word of God right there. You can fall from a steadfast place. You could let your guard down one time, accept the teaching that's not true. Before you know it, it's invading your spiritual life. And this stuff is like, Paul called it gangrene. I didn't use that term. It's, it's cancerous to faith. Some of this garbage that's being taught out there. It's straight trash. It's garbage teaching. And it deceives people. And, the, and nobody challenges it anymore. They just accept it. Well, so-and-so said it, and he's got a $90 million mega ministry. It doesn't matter how big your ministry is. That doesn't mean you're blessed. It just means you're a good swindler sometimes. 
It's funny because some of the best men of God that I know and have met over the past 20 something years are mainly very small and not widely known. You know, like Guy. Guy's not on TV. He'll never be on TV. He got kicked out of the Bible college because they're, because they're preaching unsound stuff. And he came to the board of directors like, well, that's not biblical what you're teaching them. You need to leave. It's shocking. I don't know that there's a Bible college much that I could recommend to go through that's totally safe. I know there's a few that I like, but it's, it's like some of the stuff they're turning out is not the truth. It's a scary time we live in. But here's what we're supposed to be. Here's the good news. But grow in what? Grace and knowledge. Of who? Here's where you're supposed to grow. You're supposed to grow in grace, and you're supposed to grow in knowledge of Christ. Christ Jesus Christ is supposed to be the center of our lives. Not how well we do this and that, how well we obey the Ten Commandments, how much we go to church, then it becomes about you. It, it needs to be about Jesus Christ. He has to be the center. When you're growing in grace, and, I, and when you're growing in grace, you're going to manifest fruits in your life naturally, because that's what grace does. Grace is the divine power. You know how sometimes growing in grace looks like? When you're suffering under a great trial for two years and you come out the other side okay. That's growing in grace, according to the Word of God. And growing in knowledge. Oh, people hate that. Oh, it's all about the heart. Just trust your heart. Right? No, it's going in. It didn't say grow in grace and the heart. It said grow in grace and knowledge. That means the information that you keep in your mind, the doctrine, the teaching, is what we're supposed to be growing in. Godly teaching. Amen? Sound, healthy doctrine leads to sound, healthy lives. So where to grow. Amen? So steadfastness, really quickly, it means stability, to be firmly set, to be fixed, or to be established. When God establishes you in a truth, let's say when God establishes you in, in the truth of your atonement. When you understand your atonement and you have a revelation of it and you understand the scriptures, how, how the cross has made you justified before God, when you're established in it, you're to be firm and immovable. Why? Because look at Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Because those who are established in the truth of your justification cannot be condemned. It's a bedrock truth. And if you are condemned, you fall from your steadfastness. Now, there are times when God will correct you, but you should be immovable once you are established in that truth. When you are established in your identity in Christ, you should be immovable in that. It should be your place of rest, and it should be your bedrock place where you are, are safe and you're immovable in. So when the enemy blames you for things, when people come against you, you know, oh well, oh well, you can't be swayed by what people think of you. You cannot. Now, if you're being a jerk, then obviously you need correction. But if you're, if you're living a godly life and you're moving forward as God calls you and such and such has a problem with you, oh well, take it up with the Lord, not my problem. I'm not, I'm not going to allow myself to, to, to somehow have a lower view of myself because someone doesn't like me. Or someone doesn't like the fact that I'm a minister from my past or make fun of me. Oh, well, you're still a loser. I've had to say it before. I know people from my past, they're losers. You're still drinking, partying. You're 46 years old, don't have a wife, no kids, no job. Okay, make fun of me. <laughs> Good luck. The mockers and scoffers. 
but we need to be immovable as we grow in grace and knowledge. So believers are to be steadfast. It is possible, according to this admonition, that we could fall from a steadfast place. To walk out a victorious, godly life of excellence is partly a result of your internal disposition coupled with an alert and watchful mind. This is a lifelong calling. If we are not on guard and vigilant, it is possible to be carried away or caught up in the doctrines of false teachers. The word carried away means to be identified with and then led away, to be carried away or led off together. It's used three times in the New Testament, only once positively and twice negatively, being carried away by false teaching. You're literally carried away. I, my wife and I, we know people. We know people who have gone here years ago who have been carried away into bad teaching. And we warn these folks, that stuff's not healthy, that's not the truth, blah, 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 blah. And they were carried right out of the church. Carried right out into lunacy. It's going to happen. They're casualties of war. Didn't keep their guard up kept the soft spot for false teachers in their lives when they were warned to cut them off. Don't let the lunatics in your life cut them off. The loony teaching, you got to cut it off. It has no place in your life. Don't even hold, hold weight of it a second. It's some, some crazy stuff going on right now. Right, Dina? Our last part. To counter... The backsliding is to grow in grace and knowledge. That means growing in Christ and the foundations of the new covenant. And this verse clearly speaks of process. Growing in grace and knowledge is a lifelong process. It's also part of your ongoing sanctification. Growing in grace means the sanctification or spiritual maturity is starting to take hold of your life. You're starting to take hold of truth. You're starting to grow. You're starting to stabilize. You're starting to be healthy and you're starting to be fruitful. That's how your sanctification plays out and bears fruit. You know, if I had a graph on here, like an unstable Christian bounces like this, but never moves upward. A healthy Christian has little bounces here and there because you have rough days and rough seasons, but you're slowly, slowly, inexorably going up the scale. You have little ups and downs, but your downs don't go too low and your ups don't go too high. You're a steady eddy because the steady eddy wins the race ultimately. Amen? You have to pace yourself. It's a marathon. You can't fix everything in your life all at once. You have to have patience. You have to keep moving forward slowly as God leads. And don't make a mess of it as you're doing it. Sometimes we're so zealous to grow that we're like bulls in the china shop. Slow down. Don't smash stuff in your way you're not supposed to. And let grow at God's pace in your life. You can't fix yourself overnight. Sorry, I've never experienced that. I've had victories. But I'm still growing as a person. I don't have it all together. I'll never say that. I'm not as, as high up as maybe someone like Mrs. Allen. I'm still down here moving forward. You're going to be shocked when you get to heaven. And Miss Allen's going to be like a 60-foot tall angel flying around or something. <laughs> There's going to be rainbows and unicorns all around her. Don't forget emoji hearts. Right? And peaches. There's certain people that are just very sweet and loving. Amen? And then there's certain people that just slap you. I don't know. But we need them both. Sometimes you're loved by an embrace, and sometimes it takes a spanking. Both is love. Isn't the truth? Isn't that the truth? Amen. And so, a victorious and fruitful believers 
have a constant yearning for spiritual growth. Fruitful believers have a constant yearning for spiritual growth, right? You may take a licking, but you keep on ticking. In this area of their lives, we don't rest, per se, as become inactive, but we diligently labor. We rest in our salvation, but we labor in our growth by utilizing the provisions of the New Testament. Amen?